yeah, baby. All right, hey. 7 p.m. on the West Coast. And your boy Johnny's here. Back from a long hiatus. We're planning an iron show for tonight, but none of the boys are here. So we'll hang out. We'll see if they show up. out again. Okay, I'm gonna try. I'm trying to get Matthew here. Oh, I just saw Rabbi Mike pop online. Right, I am trying to get Matthew Miller here. I just saw Rabbi Mike pop up on my Skype and Skype. So, oh, that's good. Oh yeah, baby. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. Welcome to the Iron Show. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to give up on Matthew Miller for just a moment, and then I'm going to try to get Rabbi Mike. Hey, you're, you're kind of weak in the mic. Can you boost it at all? Working on it. Give me just a sec. Okay, we're live right now, so say, th- say something stupid. Something stupid? Ah! <laughs> live from a completely different bunker than the one you're thinking of. Yeah! <laughs> Alrighty, let's oh, see. yeah. Our we settings. I can't find our dear friend Matthew Miller. Well, he's always late. Maybe he's late. He hasn't been for the last, what, four iron shows? He's been there <laughs> while I've been passed out with low iron. And he's uh, been trying to get me, he's trying to trying to wake me up. And I've just felt really bad about it, you know. And I was like, Matthew, this week we're going to do it. This week we're going to do it. I've been, everybody's been kind of out. Rabbi Mike has been moving. And uh, he didn't have any internet for after he finally did move in. And now he's just got internet today. So this is a fresh Comcast connection for him here, I guess. Oh, yeah. And Although I uh, made sure that I would be able to get on even if Comcast failed to show up. So. Right, you got a phone with one of them fancy hotspots on it. Yeah, paid for by my work now. It's kind of nifty that way. That's I like here. that. All right, I'm bringing up the mark on a bit. How's that sound? More. More? How's that? More. There? Yeah. More. Alrighty. Let me look at your level here. Hang on a second. Me, uh... How's that? Okay, let me see. Okay. Okay, go ahead. I think and... I've got boosted to about maximum at the moment. Are you really? Yeah, yeah. well, and I'm just... The thing is, I uh, have not found my headphones with the really nice mic you sent me yet, so I'm just doing off the laptop phones here. Okay, And the That's room okay. is partially decorated. Uh, am I getting an echo at all? Not at all. No, I haven't okay, got good. enough level for you to get an echo anyway. It's like we're so under first half the house echoes right now. Well, oh yeah, I mean you can get some. There's some reverb, but there's no echo. There's no slapback, which is what we. That's the bad stuff. The slapback. Oh, okay. The slapback is usually when 
when you've got like me on the speakers over there, and like <laughs> so your mic is picking me up and slapping back at me. And uh, yeah, if everybody has a headset, then usually we're okay on slapback. Little uh, uh, podcasting tip for you, Skypey broadcasting podcasting tip. Um, even if everybody's on headsets, if if uh, you got your level up too much in the studio, you're gonna get a slapback anyway. So it's usually any type of slapback or even feedback. It's usually because somebody's got too much level. And uh, that is uh, that creeps in and bleeds over, and you know, uh, Councilor Mark told me that uh, you know uh, the human condition is a lot like that. Whenever you're getting a lot of feedback and slapback, usually you need to find whatever is going on wherever you have too much level and turn it down. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, I just found yet another dial to turn up here. How am I coming across now? Um, not anymore than you were, but I can... I can, how about if I lean into the uh, laptop a bit, how's that? Well, you look real good on the level meter, so, I mean, I can't complain at all. Um, let's see here. Have you heard I from Matthew? You, Cause I think we're expecting an actual, you know, professional podcast where we do all this stuff in advance. That's not how we swing <laughs> here. No, it's like... Well, see, the thing is, is that we usually we usually hook up a few minutes before the show, but everybody came live after I I went live, so you're yeah. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It was my uh, daughter needed uh, some help with math, and uh, it, it just all of a sudden I looked at the time and was like, okay, honey, I hope you have those last five problems on your own because I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, you know, you can always let me know. We can start late, but let me get a little music going while I tweak some more things here in the studio. We'll just get this show started here, and hopefully Matthew will show up here. I hope so. I, oh I look yeah, forward to having him on. <laughs> oh yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to go on without Matthew. Okay, let's get this. Let's fire it up proper, and then we'll get going. And hopefully he'll. Uh, he's probably on his way home. So. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Iron iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Ah, what did I do wrong? I heard you go right. What did I do right? You're listening. You're listening to the Iron Show. Great. I'm going to have to do this manual. That sucks. <laughs> oh, no. Well, all I've got is eight and four on my keyboard. Oh, no. I can't do that. All right. Hang on. 
Let's I tell you what. Let me play some Blinky D while I set this keyboard up. Oh, this is great radio. <laughs> Whatever you need. I don't even think I have Blinky D on here now. What? No, Blinky D? That's not right. One's gotta have. I gotta have my finger on this one. Hang on. Uh, tell a story, Rabbi Mike, while I. <laughs> well, uh, actually, yeah, I can uh, share a few things. We. It's been a very interesting move. Um, in some ways, one of the easier moves we've ever done because instead of moving from a small space to another small space and trying to figure out where to put everything, we're moving from a small space into a much bigger space. Which, among other things, came with a covered garage, the first time we've had that in years, which meant that, you know, when we got here with the moving truck, it's like, all right, just put, you know, furniture where the furniture needs to go, but everything else just boxes in the garage so that we can, um, you know, not have to deal with that and, and just unpack as we go. So, as we're making the move, the uh, radiator fan on the van goes out. But ran into a guy who could fix it for us, relatively expensive, it's just taking some extra time. And because of where we moved, it's not a big deal for my wife to just run me to the train station for me to get to work. If the fan had gone out in that van, say, a week earlier, we would have been in trouble in terms of just my wife going nuts trying to get me to and from work and everything else. But the timing was perfect. The fact we found the guy to fix it was perfect. Uh, when I went to get a replacement fan from AutoZone, they didn't have the right part. And they're like, well, we can get it here in two days. I went online and found it for 50 bucks cheaper, which I wouldn't have gone looking if uh, the AutoZone had happened to have it when they said they did. I mean, it's like every time we've dealt with one of those real annoyances, you can see God positively interfering uh, to actually turn a negative into a positive or at least mitigate the negative. So we've just seen God's hand through this entire move. I'm uh, missing the positive. And which fan was it? The heater fan or the radiator fan? The radiator fan. Oh, they, not in the summer. You can't. You can do that in the winter. You can live without one. But in the summer, no way. As soon as you get into traffic, uh oh. Exactly, and that's how we found it. It starts spiking up in traffic. So where was uh, the good? What's the good thing in in that story? I'm sure there is. Well, number one good thing, um, we found a guy to do the repairs uh, not a mile from the place where we live now, which means that getting it to him wasn't a big deal. Um, he was willing to, he does the work fairly cheap, a lot, I mean, to fix it, uh, we took it to Goodyear just to have it diagnosed and uh, have him check the electronics and so forth, and they wanted like 600 bucks to fix it. We found somebody willing to fix it for like 75 bucks plus parts, so I'm only spending about a fourth of what I would have taken it to the Goodyear. Isn't that amazing um, when you find a decent, honest mechanic? Yep, and he's a little bit slow on the work, mostly because he's not always great about communicating exactly what he needs me to go pick up, you know, in terms of the parts and all that, and to bring to him to it's put like, in. Who cares? For seventy-five bucks? <laughs> yep, that, that was my thing. It's like okay, you know, it's it's gone on a little bit longer because it turned out he was he was originally he had a fan from a uh, similar make model and year that would have been compatible that he was willing to just swap in and you know 75 bucks not even for the parts it's just that fan turned out not to work so we're and we've been delayed while i've ordered another fan in to pop it in but the new fan's only like 80 bucks so you know it, it's been 80 bucks for the fan 75 bucks for the work and i think i spent another 22 dollars on a uh uh, relay that we needed to go ahead and replace anyway. Uh, still a quarter of what it would have cost us at Goodyear, and because again we're like we live about 15 minutes from the uh, train station I take to go into work, so it's not a big deal for Sarah to you know go ahead and put the kids in the car and just run me to the train station every morning, um, and then come pick me up. It's actually turned into some nice time for Sarah and I to just talk, uh, you know, to and from work away, you know, away from all the stuff going on at home. Uh, so, you know, even in the negative, God turned it into a positive. Um, the, uh, uh, I mean, it, it's, that's like the biggest example, but it's been a whole bunch of stuff like that. I mean, um, where I've had, I'm trying to learn a whole new job, which is very, very involved. It's a startup company, so it's a lot of, you know, doing a lot of heavy lifting and late hours. Um, I was actually working on uh, some work while I was uh, helping my daughter with her homework right up to the time of the show, but... Uh, it's paying for what we need to pay for, and my boss is very understanding about you know flex time and that kind of bit, which is, again has been absolutely wonderful for this move. I haven't had to like count hours in terms of you know do I have the time off or anything like that. It's just like go do it, take care of your family. 
Um, we've, uh, I mean, it, it's, just, it's one thing after another on that. So it's nice to see God's hand in the whole thing. Every, everything just has been gelling. And it's like, I've, I can't, this job's like tougher than what I've ever done before. And I'm having to, I'm like used to the, being the guy in the office that knows how to do everything. And so since I'm the guy in the office that doesn't know how to do everything, I've sometimes felt like, oh no, I'm failing. I'm going to you know, lose my job. Da, 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 da. It's just the adversary beating on me. And every time that happens, God just like, you know, he'll line up so the trains arrive perfectly on time. So I'm not spending as much time waiting for them and, and that kind of thing. And just as, and I can just feel his spirit saying, look, I got you handled right down to the timing of the trains. Relax. I gave you this job. You don't need to worry about it. You just keep doing what you're supposed to be doing, you know. Um, so it's it's been uh, stretching my faith a bit. <laughs> To, uh, to live on that basis. It, where my previous job I could definitely do in my own strength. This one I'm definitely relying a lot on God's strength to uh, uh, get to learn everything fast enough. And, it, and I think it's going you know, to be one I'm very successful at. And I'm learning a lot about building an organization from uh, scratch in the process. So, Man, that's great. That's great news. Yep. It's going to go well into um, someday building a full-time ministry, I think. Uh, I don't feel God calling me to like jump straight into that. I think I'd be here and doing ministry part time for a few years, which is just fine. But it's I've seen organizations fall apart, both religious and secular, fall apart for not knowing how to grow and how to anticipate growth and uh, to organize people and motivate them and so forth. And now I'm seeing an organization that really knows how to grow, is willing to put the money into the people, is willing to is very careful to get the right people in place and to empower them and to also make sure they've got the breaks they need and everything else. And I'm just like, wow, I can learn a lot about this. This has got to be so handy <laughs> with what God wants me to do ultimately. So, um, you know, Baruch Hashem, praise the Lord. Oh, yeah, that's great, man. That's great. Yeah, I don't know. You know, not. it's not always, it's not always, though, that... Uh, um, you can tell that God's working in your life when things are going great. Sometimes you can really tell when things are going really bad, too. Exactly. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that. It's, uh, you know, it's something to think about. You know, um, he may be setting something great up for you, and you can't, there's no way you can see it. You mm -hmm. know? And uh, unless he, unless he uh, is there to... Uh, unless he's, if he doesn't have you in that bad situation or allow these things to happen, you're not going to be ready for what's coming your way, what he's got planned for you. So, well, exactly. I mean, I mean, take for example the house we're renting right now. Um, Sarah and I would eventually like to own a house and own some property because that gives us a little bit more flexibility. But we weren't quite in the position to do that yet. Need my uh, uh, somewhat larger salary to show up on the credit reports and stuff first. But oh yeah, um, it, you know you know how that goes. But um, we uh, Sarah was starting to get worried, and I was starting to get a little bit worried too. Although I didn't tell her that about the fact that you know we're coming up against a deadline. The deadline is the start of school. You know we need to be in the house and everything ready to go at the start of school. So my daughter's not having to like start two weeks in one place and then move or anything like that. And some houses that looked very promising uh, fell through. But as we looked at them, you know, we can see where that would be a problem. We can see that, that you know, the landlord that in that one didn't seem to have it Gara and so forth. Well, um, my, uh, you know, uh, Chaplain Wolf, uh, who uh, many of you on there and show already know, of course, actually came up from Florida to help us with the organizing, the packing, the moving, and everything else. And he was touring around. Uh, doing like the initial looks at the house with Sarah and he like he shot me an email in the middle of the day It's like Michael you need to move on this one and so I, I did and um, you know landlord had sent a application to me and I sent it back uh, the same day uh, using DocuSign and going ahead and including some of my work documentation so I could see that yes I could pay for it and just handling it very professional and he in turn turned around and it's like okay you know if you can go ahead and give me the deposit, I will go ahead and take it off the market. I'm like, yeah, can we get started moving early? He's like, well, can you get the deposit and the first month's rent? God had provided that we had it in the bank. So I'm just like, yes, here it is. And that let us move over the course of like a week and a half, which made things a lot easier because we just bring loads over. And the new landlord, 
Uh, we caught him by surprise. I think he was expecting to have the house on the market for another month or two because we came in. There are like a few things here and there that still need to be fixed, but he's been going around fixing them. You can tell he's professional. He knows his stuff. He's a great guy. He's great with the kids. Um, and so I think that you know we are quite content with where God has us. We're comfortable. Um, and my daughter's in one of the best school systems in Georgia. Uh, right now and you know for the price we're getting the rental at that you know it's I mean God pulled everything together and kept it where I needed it to be in my budget every single element pulled together in God's own time to provide for us and that's and it's a blessing to see that um, I got a uh, uh, email that you uh, pa- from someone that you'd sort of passed on to me uh, yes yes here real quick uh, Katie, yeah, Katie had gotten in touch because she had met somebody who was in a rough place in his life, um, and I'm not sure if the gentleman wants me to mention my name. I'll, I'll wait until I uh, find out. But yeah, she, the guy had, um, the guy had met her online, I guess on Facebook, and was sending her like, um, was coming on to her and flirting with her and sending her dirty messages and stuff and. She was like she she wanted to play with him cuz oh we're at, oh we're at, oh have my mic is offline I'll have to get him back there I Skype is trying to Skype him back here so here we are working on it at the moment it's uh Skype is trying to call him do 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 oh yeah Yep, yep, let's play some music here, a little Johnny Rainbow. Oh yeah, this is a well-organized iron show. For those of you who have, uh, are still listening uh, to the stream, <laughs> this is Iron Show Live. We come on after L.A. Marzulli on the Fringe Radio Network. Thursday nights at 7 o'clock, West Coast. Uh, so, but we're having a really, really, really rough time. Uh, one of our one of our uh, members of our crew here is missing, and he's probably on the road right now. Matthew Miller, we're trying to get a hold of him. Me and M- Rabbi Mike are just kind of hanging out, waiting for uh, Matthew Miller to show up. So it's a pretty, very laid back and very unstructured session. And I just lost Rabbi Mike, so I'm going to try to call him back. Go. Sorry yeah. about that. There we, we go. A, the power it. just went out over here. It's back up, but it's flickering a little bit. We we had a storm blow through earlier, and I know we've had some down power lines. Oh, so that's I just right. switched over to my emergency backup system, aka my uh, cell phone, which I've got a link on uh, to uh, maintain the call. So if it flickers out again, it shouldn't affect the uh, call here for a bit. I think the adversary didn't want me to share that story. <laughs> That is a really great um, signal you've got. Are you using that cell phone hotspot right now? Yep, I That's am. That's a nice signal. It is, uh, and it's one of those benefits that my work is now paying for. So I uh, was discussing being the fact that I was going to be down without um, uh, Internet right at the time I was um, on some duties that required me to be on call. And my uh, uh, supervisor was like, well, you know, for our particular group, because we do have to have hotspots with us for demonstrations with clients and so forth, you do get to uh, expense that. I'm like, really? She's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, I'm going out to get myself a new phone and to get it and to set up to be a wireless hotspot. So I did that this last week. Um, that's why even if the Comcast wasn't ready tonight, I was ready with a signal. That but, is so cool. Yep, I'm willing to burn off some of my, uh, I I do have limited gigabytes, but I don't think it's going to get eaten up in one night and it renews on the 23rd anyway. So um, I'm going to stay on this for just a little bit in case the power flickers again, and I can switch over to the main house line in a bit if needs be. Anyway, to tell that story. Anyway, hang on, let me add Matthew to the call here. Oh, good, Matthew's with us. Yeah, we're going to try anyway. I see his light is on. The light is on and Matthew's home. (laughs) <laughs> Matthew Miller Hello Matthew 
I hear him. I hear him moving around. I hear him stirring. Hey, it's me, baby. Hey, baby. Oh, yeah. Uh, it is me, baby. What's up? Oh, dude. This is awesome. All right. I feel like I'm alive now. Rabbi Mike was telling a story. I guess we better let him continue there. Yeah, we probably should. Anyway, um, you, uh, Katie uh, got in touch with me because she had met a gentleman online. Oh, who, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to tell that part. Yeah, he was flirting yeah. with her and uh, giving her like rude, dirty comments. And she told me that she goes, like, I was tempted because, you know, she's lonely and she's, you know, and um, – She's, but she told him. She goes, "Look, I'm a Christian. You can't. We can't do that kind of stuff. You know, You're either gonna talk to me like a Christian man, or I'm gonna, you know, pull the plug." And so anyway, I'll let Rabbi Mike. So I anyway, she wanted me to talk to him, and I'm like, you know what, Rabbi Mike's a lot better about that stuff than I am. I'm not like I don't like do that kind of thing. Really, I'm not really like a disciple guy. I'm kind of strictly gateway. So, <laughs> so I refer. I said, "Look, I'll get him in touch with Rabbi Mike." So you got a hold of him, and yeah, I got. I, I uh, uh, called him up on the uh, number she gave me. Left him a message. He called me back, and uh, we just started talking. And obviously, you know, lots of it's under the uh, cover of the conf- confessional, so to speak. But um, he actually, he and his wife uh, used to do ministry. And he had hit a really bad spot in his life with, um, you know, just a job falling out from under him, temptations coming his way, uh, sins that he had never uh, fully dealt with uh, cropping back up and so forth. And his conversation with Katie convinced him, look, I need to get right with the Lord again. So I'm checking in with him every few days. Um, He's actually gotten embedded in a... uh, uh, small home fellowship, which is perfect for the kind of... um, uh, fellowship and accountability he needs up close, but of course I'm going to uh, maintain contact with him. But already he could see his life starting to come back together. I mean, you know, like he he had lost his um, job, and he's a plumber by trade. And so, you know, uh, if anyone's in the North Car- in North Carolina looking for a plumber, I'll uh, happily check and see if he's in your area and, and direct him your way. But uh, it's like, you know, he it, just everything had fallen out. He didn't have a truck, he didn't have anything. And he just saw God lining things up with, you know, like a truck that he was able to get well below market value, but a really good truck in the, in, within his budget so he could get back on that, getting tools and just everything's coming back together as he was coming back to the Lord. And it, was, and it was very evident that what God was trying to do was to get him to that point where he would deal with some of the sin in his life, where he recognized that he'd, you know, not really been dependent on God enough, and where he could then say, okay, now let me show you what I'm going to do now that you know that you can't do it anymore. And it was really neat to see how some of that uh, timing was so much so similar to the timing I've been seeing in my life over the past, uh, uh, coming up on a year now since things started going south at my old synagogue, in terms of God just pr- opening up the doors as, you know, other doors seem to be closing and, you know, taking care of my family and putting everything in place at just the right time and everything else. So God is still very much at work. He still does miracles. and He still loves his people. Um, you know, oh, yeah. if we will cleave to him. He will open those doors. They're not always the doors that we thought we were going to go through. Right, Matthew? Uh, no, and sometimes you go through them kind of with a crash, but uh, <laughs> it's 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 yeah. never what you expect. Uh, but it is always what he expects. Uh, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, at least and, we uh, know somebody knows what's going on, right, Matthew? Oh, beyond any shadow of a doubt. I mean, look at the uh, just look at the Iron Show uh, and its affiliations with Rabbi Mike and myself. Oh uh, yeah. I mean, this is stretched back years now, correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Five and, uh, years. And could any of us have saw or perceived then uh, that uh, that's what the Lord had planned all along? No. No, of course not. So, uh, you know, that that's the way he is. And that's the way we line up. <laughs> really, everybody. Uh, you, you know, and let me say this about this, this gentleman that obviously has had a rough spot. Well... Look, everybody, um, I've said this before, I think, on this show, but you have to realize that there are people out there that need ministering, too, and they will not hear you 
They will not tolerate you. Lest you have been there. Okay, so I'm sure uh, there's more than just the one that we're referencing to right now. That is the case listening to The Iron Show. And I bet I just stung you in the side. Look, if you were in times past ministering before the Lord your God and you got a crash course in life, don't you know who He is? (laughs) He will wield you into whatever He wishes. And if He has sheep um, that you know, are incurring certain difficulties and uh, are going through hardships and they will not, they cannot be ministered to anyone except one by which and through which the things the Lord had set aside for you to get a crash course under. You better get back in the saddle. At least once you've heard this conversation. You need to get up. Okay. And get back in the saddle. The spirit ever rushes forward. Ever going to minister to his little ones. So. Get up. You're not the first one. And guess what? You're not going to be the last. You know what? I personally know two ministers that are well above par. Both of them are felons. Both of them have spent time in jail. But you want to know something? When it comes to the rough cuts, they won't listen to nobody else. They won't. Look, (laughs) there is quite a few... Uh, women ministers out there uh, that have had abortions. Well, guess what? I know two. That's not one, but two ministries that minister to women such as these. And guess what? I can't cut it. They won't hear me. Rabbi Mike cannot console them. He knows nothing. Johnny has never had an abortion. What does he know? Yeah, what do I know? I mean, so when it comes to situations like this, it's not that uh, you have crashed from Christianity. No, it's only that thing if you wish it. But you have forgotten his glory if you perceive in your little bitty brain that he can't turn what you perceive as a disaster into glory. Amen. And he won't do it for your sake. And I'll just be up front with you about that. What you went through, it wasn't for you. Get over yourself. That's good point. It was for his glory. So that all of a sudden, someone could be exactly where he needed them to be when someone needed ministered to. I mean, that's just a fact of life. That is the force of his will. It just is. So that's all I have to say to uh, this one that got caught up in just the right space. Look, wake up. You actually think that this little tale that Johnny just told was all happenstance. If you cannot see the Lord my God's fingerprints all over it, you're a little bit slower than you've aforesumed. I mean, come on. Where does this girl live, Johnny? Does she live any remotely close to your trailer park at the end of the world? No, she's like in Arkansas. Okay, so surely she lives in a suburb of Atlanta, Georgia, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> Arkansas, dude. <laughs> okay, okay. And, and so she isn't remotely... Con- Even in the smallest hint, is she connected with anybody in North Carolina? Or or a plumber, right? Nope. It's amazing. Wake up! Wake wake up, up. people! Wake up! Look what God did. 
<laughs> I mean, stand back for once in your life and wonder after his marvels. That's that's all I can say. Uh, yeah. Who would have ever, he would have never thought that if he, when he started uh, flirting with this girl in Arkansas, it would lead to all of this. No. I mean, really? That's a God thing, right? I mean, come on. That's right. And you know what is amazing? It's now the girl realizes the price she was going to pay had she fallen from her grace. She had no idea what was at stake, but she had the strength and the fortitude to do what was right and realize she was in a situation outside of her hands, outside of her power, and there was nothing she could do, and she was being tempted Johnny himself said she was lonely. Yeah. Yet this one had the strength to pick up the phone. Who do you know has the big guns? Johnny. Josh oh. Peck sent her my way. Thank you, Josh. So he's Amen. involved in all this. So. And she, by the way, she showed some persistence there because John Peck... It's like, well, I'm not sure, but let me, you know, let you talk to Johnny. Johnny's like, oh, I'm not the right person for it, but let me punch him right by Mike. When she, when she got to me, she was fully prepared. If I passed her on to the next person, to keep going until she found someone to give this guy a call back because he needed it. That's persistence, and that is faith. Yeah, she kept That's after me because I had actually forgotten about it. You know, because my life is just going through a big storm right now. And I had actually spaced it. She came after me twice. And I think the third time I finally got her over to Rabbi Mike. Which, shame on me. But, yeah, she was very persistent. I mean, come on. Yep. And, that's the, and that is the nature of faith. Okay. Faith and faithfulness. Are, are the two sides of the coins. The, the biblical, the Greek word for faith means both. And she, was, she had faith that God was going to provide someone, that God hadn't just dropped this person into her life to uh, dismiss her. Hey, hon. Uh, and she had the faithfulness to keep on going, even when, you know, like, first person she, she called didn't work out. And by the way, we're being joined by my lovely wife. Let me try to orient this so she's picked up on the microphone as well. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> Finally escaping the babies. I have escaped prison. I'm on, I'm on parole for now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Is she being picked up okay? Yeah. Awesome. Sounds good to me, yeah. After the power outage, I just started routing it through my phone, so we're good. <laughs> cool. All right. We should probably so start this thing. You know, we haven't actually started the show yet. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> this is, uh, the first 40 minutes has all been just sort of lead in here. <laughs> well, we just been I, I mean, well, praise the Lord. I finally have a study here to work from. So I've like, actually got most of my books on the shelves behind me. I, I'm, I'm, I lost a few uh, with the, that I left behind at the synagogue when I walked out the doors there. You know, stuff that's easily replaced. I got the most important things. But I actually have, for the first time in months all of my uh, research material around me oh, where I can get a hold of it. I've not had time to play with it as much yet just because I've, I've been busy with you know the move and unpacking and that kind of thing but uh, I actually have the ability to go look stuff up now so it's <laughs> the only thing I don't have is I have not gotten my uh, uh, searchable Talmud onto this computer yet but that will come. <laughs> oh, wow that'll be a trip. Okay let's get this thing going. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Iron iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Of his You're listening to the Iron Show with Johnny McMahon. We're proud to have the Iron Show right here on Fringe Radio Network. That's FringeRadioNetwork.com. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Here it comes, baby. Oh yeah!
Matthew. Oh, Johnny, it is so pleasant to be here with you. I know. And now we have Rabbi Mike. And, well, I'm even sweating. I'm so excited. Shall we ride? Yes, let's ride. What's up? Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah, oh, yeah! We're back! Oh, we're back! Oh, yeah! Oh, Rabbi Mike. When you are going through a long struggle and everything looks so dark and so black and finally you see a light at the end of the tunnel. But oh dear, it's a very large train about to squish you like a Michael Bug. Does it make you cry? No, but it might make me quote Metallica. <laughs> what do they the, say? The fumes, What's up? The fumes, your tunnel is a train truck running your way. And I know I just butchered that horribly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! Oh yeah! Yeah! Oh yeah! All right, we're down here with Matthew Miller. And Rabbi Michael Bug. And we are uh, we are about to engage in a study in the book of Judges. So uh, we were going to we we're going to uh, get into this real quick here. Um, first, I would like to thank some people that have helped me out. Actually, one major person that's helped me out recently is Brother Roderick. And uh Brother Roderick, uh, he really bailed me out. He sent me a hundred bucks. He told me with a note that said, Here, Johnny, take this and get yourself a shave and a haircut and a cup of coffee. But actually, he really bailed me out because I'm like broke this week. So uh, uh, he really helped me a lot. So, Roderick, what's up? Thank you. I'm telling you, man. It's a real, real Christian there, Roderick. And uh, speaking of uh, Roderick, oh, a couple months ago, he had a question for you guys. Actually, give it to Matthew Miller. He wanted to know from the pros uh, why um, having multiple wives was okay in the New Testament, uh, the Old Testament, but not in the New Testament, Matthew. As the music fades away. (laughs) (laughs) Well, God himself said, because it wasn't this way since the beginning. Now. uh, Oh, Johnny. When you come home from a hard day of work, and one of your four wives comes to you while you're sweating and tired, and says, I have bought you for a mandrake root. You must come with me. Does it make you cry? Oh, yes. (laughs) I second that one. Sometimes God doesn't forbid things. He just shows us why it's a really stupid idea. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, everything's, well, I'd like to have 16 wives. Right. What if they all want you to mow the lawn? (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) One wife is plenty for me. I'm sorry, Matthew. I just had to jump in there. <laughs> yeah, that, that was excellent. But we all need to remember that the only restriction is to elders. They yep. must be a husband of but one wife. So he is incorrect in his assumption. He's been listening to somebody else other than the Bible. Uh, it's quite clear in the scripture that, uh, no, nobody ever says no. Uh, but in, in this certain instance... Uh, because he's already going to have all kinds of trouble on his head being an elder. Uh, he should be the wife or the husband of but one wife. Uh, but that is the only restriction uh, that there is. And, of course, God says it wasn't it wasn't that way since the beginning. Uh, and, of course, God likes things to <laughs> be at the end as they were in the beginning. Uh, so, yeah, that's one thing people don't think about. Um, that's the only restriction 
uh, is just to elders. So, I mean, but as far as we go, uh, we are lawful whenever we can be. So that is against the uh, the legality of the United States. So, no, you shouldn't do it. I mean, just like uh, oh, lots of people love asking me about smoking pot. Well, no, it's illegal. You so can drink, yeah. Unless but, you're in Oregon. Yeah, I mean, it's illegal. Not in Oregon. They just legalized it. They sell it in stores. Well, then, fine. Uh, do I have a problem with it then? No, no more than I have a problem with somebody uh, that drinks alcohol. Uh, but I will uh, say exactly what the Bible says. You know, uh, if you're a drunk, you're in sin. What's that mean? Well, it, it, it's the same uh, uh, sin as laziness. You know, uh, anything in excess is the wrong answer. So, I mean, if you wind up a pothead, I guess, as, as people call them, yeah, you're in sin. Get over yourself. But... So if you live in um, Oregon, you could probably smoke pot once in a while, but you can't be a pothead. That would be sad. Right, you can't be a pothead. And if you live in New York City, you can't be a drunk. Uh, you know, so... But you can drink, yeah. I mean, lots of people like asking me that, too. Well, we don't, you know, drink at all. Really, well, the New Testament plainly says that you should have uh, at least eight uh, ounces, technically. That's our definition of a cup, uh, once a day for your many ailments. And then they look at me like I'm stupid. Well, we're Baptist. Well, that's cool. I'm I'm cool with that. You're so you're a Baptist. <laughs> I mean that that means nothing to me. I want to know what he said. Yeah. <laughs> well, you yeah. know, Jews as a rule don't recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Protestants don't recognize the authority of the Pope, and Baptists don't recognize each other in the liquor store. I mean, it's just. <laughs> I mean, we actually had a guy one time come into one of our um, uh, uh, study halls uh, at my old synagogue and uh, got all incensed when we were discussing drinking responsibly as part of the thing. He's like, and we're just like, well, dude, you know, Yeshua drank. And he's like, Jesus didn't drink. I'm like, what are you talking about? He drank every time he had a Passover at the very least. And he's like, no, he didn't. That was grape juice. I'm like, How? The grape harvest is six months away from Passover. Unless, yeah. you know, there's an unrecorded miracle of Jesus inventing refrigeration. That was fermented wine he was having. That's the only way it would work. And he was just, it, it's something, it, he'd never thought of that before. I mean, it, people have weird assumptions. Yeah, um, you know, a lot of, I was told, you know, in my formation that, uh, you know, when Jesus turned the water into wine, it was so people could drink it without getting sick because the water is, uh, you know, back there usually was bad. It had protozoans <laughs> and, you know, all kinds of bugs in it. But, you know, and then I said, well, wait a minute. I went and read it and I came back and I said, wait a minute. It says they had water by their means of purification. So right there it was already pure. And then he changed it to wine. I mean, so, and they didn't have much to say about that. <laughs> Well, here's another one for you. Uh, Yeshua said, you know, well, look, John the Baptist came not eating or drinking. They say he has a demon. Now, obviously, he wasn't referring to John the Baptist drinking water, right? John the Baptist was a Nazarite, and therefore he didn't drink wine. He didn't drink alcohol. And he didn't, when he says he didn't, didn't come eating, it meant that he fasted a lot. He didn't, you know, he was eating locusts and honey. And then he turns around and says, well, here comes the Son of Man eating and drinking. They say he's glutton and a drunkard. Okay, by contrast and by the accusation uh, of being a drunkard, it is very obvious that what he's saying is like, look, the Son of Man, the Messiah comes, and I'm eating and drinking like a normal Jewish man of the first century. Yeah. Okay, guess what? That means he had alcohol. Did he drink to excess? No. Did he drink? Yes. Yep. Okay, that was the, the norm at the time. Um, and, it still you know, is like, in most countries, in a lot of countries, and not only like Italy. I mean, you just don't eat without wine. Yeah. France, same with France. In America, I mean, it's not so much, not so common, but there's a lot of places where it's still, that's the norm. Yeah, Sarah and I enjoy kicking back and enjoying a nice glass of wine together. I mean, it's not a big deal. It's a matter about, uh, you know, drinking to excess and drinking to drunkenness. Right. If Rabbi Mike was under the table drinking his wine, there would be an <laughs> issue with Sarah splashing water in his face. <laughs> 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 uh, it's moderation it's yeah. it's about I, w I would look at wine as being a, one of those things that God has given for a blessing I mean even the Psalms say that God gave wine to gladden the hearts of men so it's meant as a blessing but as with many of the things that God means for us to, uh, to us as a blessing wine 
sex, food, uh, you know, uh, material possessions and so forth. God means these things for our blessings, but taken to excess and taken to the point where you love the object, any of them can become a snare and a curse instead. And actually, you know, like, for example, sex is one of the most wonderful things that God has given us. But it's also one of the most dangerous, and that's why he puts so many rules around it. Because it, it, with that great blessing comes the possibility of it being twisted into a great curse. And I look at alcohol the same way. Um, that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, I, my kids, I give, you know, little teeny tiny, like, barely thimbleful um, of wine on Shabbat. Uh, why? Because I want them from a young age to associate wine with a sacred meal. And therefore, you know, A, it's not forbidden fruit. It's not like, oh, there's alcohol here. I must drink all the alcohol because I may not get it again or anything like that. And B, it teaches them that, hey, yes, this is a blessing, but it is to be treated in a sacred manner lest it become a snare to me. I like that. That makes a lot of sense. That's a really good well, idea. Well, that's another aspect of the becoming a byword. I mean, that is a curse. And, well, look, <laughs> if you... Abuse wine. Guess what? There's a byword for that. You're a wino. That's what you are. You're not. You're not a Christian. You're a wino. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you uh, are in a state where it's legal and you smoke a whole bunch of pot, guess what? You're a pothead. You're not a Christian. Okay. Yep. And if you know, we can go on down the line. So uh, we know this from the scripture from the outset. You know, if you want to reject what is good, you're going to become a what? A byword. Uh, here, let's let's just name another few. Um, you know, a thief. Okay, uh, there's all kinds of them, isn't there? A whore. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can go on all day, uh, and this is injected into every single language on this planet. Bad things. When you cross a threshold, they are termed. There is a byword for all of it. Uh, you know, junkie. Uh, if, you know, you're an addict to heroin, I mean, we can go on all day. So, this is common knowledge. What is good Even and what is not. Even heroin has a purpose, okay? You know, opiates are powerful right. painkillers. Oh, yeah, okay. you need them if, when you're dying. It says, uh, give strong drink to them about to die. That's not talking about Jack Daniels. That's talking about yeah. gall. They tried to give it to Jesus. He turned it down so he could exactly. suffer the full weight. Of well, the, uh, but this still, is one of but the... for you... If you're but dying, you thing. can have the opium, I mean, or hurt badly. Yeah, well, yeah, all these things are meant for our good, okay? It's a matter of turning them into a curse. Like, you know, if you have, it, it, it's like I've got a friend in the mountains of South Carolina, and, you know, he's a, you know, uh, blue-collar uh, kind of guy, and he's talked about, you know, how he gets at the end of a really hard day, and he'll sit there with uh, a, a glass of whiskey and a, his corncob pipe and just chill. And it's relaxing to him. Okay, well, now he's mixing two Baptist sins. You know, he's smoking and drinking. Well, he's not doing either to excess. He's not chain-smoking that pipe. He's sitting back on his porch at the end of a hard day and just relaxing with it. There's nothing wrong with that. He's not letting it master him. He doesn't get the shakes if he doesn't have it. Uh, he's not, he doesn't go through severe nicotine withdrawal during the day wanting to have his next uh, you know, cigarette or anything like that. And likewise with the whiskey. I happen to know from knowing him many years, he can go through, he's fine with going through multiple days without it. He's using it responsibly the way God intended for the benefit. Okay. Likewise, food. We eat good food and we should eat good food. It should be del we should prepare it to be delicious. It should be a delight. But we then have to regulate ourselves if we don't overdo it. Because otherwise, something we need to survive can kill us, you know, over time. So it's a, all things are a matter of God has given us bounds. We don't need to narrow those bounds with a whole bunch of fences and laws and traditions. I do believe that Yeshua had some arguments with people over that over time. Uh, but we don't want to go outside those bounds either. Sometimes it's safe to stay a little bit further inside the bounds than God permits. But... The main thing is God has set careful boundaries so we can enjoy all the fullness of life. We can enjoy everything that he has given us in a way that doesn't become a snare for the adversary. Well, you mentioned another case in point, Rabbi Mike. You mentioned time. I heard you say it. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, everything's beautiful in its time. That's what he just described about this gentleman. Mm -hmm. Okay, He knows that whiskey uh, is not in a beautiful time at work or when he's operating a chainsaw. Or driving okay. or anything else, yeah. Right, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, when my daughter gets married, uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, if the uh, occasion arises and, you know, I might get hammered, I don't know. Do I intend to get hammered? No, but <laughs> it's in its place, and it's good. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, we're not saying don't be joyful or anything like that, but, uh, well, this is another aspect of it, is that, Everything is beautiful in its time, even as he has said. Hey Amen. It reminds me of uh, it reminds me of when my daughter became a teenager, and my wife came to me, and she goes, um, "It's time for you to have the drug talk with your daughter." And I was like, "Oh no, I don't want to do." It. She, I go, "You? Why don't you do it?" She goes, "You're." She, he goes, "She goes, you know about that stuff. I don't know anything about drugs." Because you're the one who knows all that stuff, rock singer and all that. And I'm like, okay, all right. So I sat down with my daughter. I said, all right, look, drugs, drugs are a problem. I said, um, if you do drugs, do them once, do them right, and then be done with it for a long time. I said, don't try to make that stuff last. That's gay. And my, <laughs> wife, my wife just freaked. Do them once, do them right. Don't try to make it last. That's gay. You don't call that a drug talk. <laughs> I go, well, yeah. I mean, because look, we don't want our kids doing drugs, but we also, we also have to realize that some of our the, our kids are going to do it no matter what we say. And uh, there's just some kids that are just, they're just they they're like they got to experience whatever they're going to experience, and so. You know, you got to give them some practical advice, you know. And my daughter never did any drugs ever in her life. She's she's an old woman now. She's about Rabbi Mike's age. And uh, so... <laughs> what the heck? How old is he? <laughs> I'm 53 next month. No way. I thought he was like 25. <laughs> Thank you. That's the energy ring. Well, it's yeah, it's the energy good. ring, yeah. <laughs> well, it's like the I mean, drink, when, the when I was growing star. up, one of uh, my best friends was uh, El Salvadoran, and his mother uh, was like, "All right," and she sat us all down when we were just hanging out one night, and she's like, "Look, guys, you're getting to the point where you're driving, and you're getting to the point where you may want to experiment. If you ever feel the urge to have a big drunken party, you can come here. I will buy the alcohol, but you have to surrender your keys, and you will stay here until morning." And the funny thing is that. With that offer wide open, we had a couple of parties where there was alcohol served. Nobody got drunk because it wasn't like, oh, man, it's forbidden fruit. I must drink all the – again, it's like that whole thing of I must drink all the alcohol. I don't know when I'll see it again. It's just like, eh, no big deal. We know we can. And we know that she, she's trusting us. So, you know, cool. We can, you know, have a couple of drink, you know, wow, beer tastes horrible, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and it, but it, it, the, I think that that – Trusting us, but at the same time saying, here's the boundary. You surrender the, your car keys. You're not going anywhere till morning if you decide to do this. Kept us safe. Yeah, and okay. For me, for me, wine was very forbidden in my home. It wasn't even drank during any holiday meals. Nobody drank wine. Dad would occasionally have a little whiskey in his coffee, but wine was just a no-no for all of us. And so, like, if I had any friends that were older than me and there was wine... I just probably went overboard because I'm like, okay, I don't know when I'm going to have this again. I'm going to go overboard. So I went overboard a lot as a teenager, and I would indulge in, when older friends would buy it for me. And then actually when I became of age, I'm like, I don't even want to drink. <laughs> it got all out of my system. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same with me. I went on a binge when I was 21, and... That was it. I really haven't drank since. I did. I've never really what? liked it. Now, especially now that I'm an old man, I, I just it just makes me feel depressed. I drink a so little what? bit. I can drink a beer, but so yeah. what? But, so it started when you was 21, and it got over what? Last Tuesday or <laughs> no? It was like 20. <laughs> no, it was like 21. What's to, up? What's up? <laughs> no, it's like 21 to 21 and a half. Let's see what the Bible says about this subject here. But if sure. the place God, your God, 
designates for worship is too far away and you can't carry your tithe that far, God, your God, will still bless you. Exchange your tithe for money and take the money to the place God, your God, has chosen to be worshipped. Use the money to buy anything you want. Cattle, sheep, wine, or beer. Anything that looks good to you. You and your family can then feast in the presence of God, your God, and have a good time. Meanwhile, don't forget to take good care of what the Levites who live in your towns. They won't get any property or inheritance of their own, as you will. At the end of every third year, gather the tithe from all your produce of that year and put it aside in storage. Keep it in reserve for the Levite who won't get any property or inheritance, as you will. And for the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow who live in your neighborhood. That way they'll have plenty to eat and God, your God, will bless you in all your work. Interesting here, there's the prosperity gospel too, along with the original tithe. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. God will bless you. Yes, it doesn't mean you. you, you but uh, let's put that into terms a little bit different than most Americans are used to thinking of it. The original prosperity gospel is: you will have shelter, you will have clothing, you will have plenty to eat and drink. The American prosperity gospel is: in addition to all that, you'll have golden toilets and a Rolls Royce <laughs> and you know everything else. If you just donate to my ministry, and I'll send you this magical handkerchief. <laughs> well, you know when. When they said to tie it, then I came in the next week with a six-pack of beer, a bottle of wine, and a sheep. They didn't understand. <laughs> that would be awesome, actually. <laughs> what? It says it right here. It says it right here. Deuteronomy 15. Uh well, Deuteronomy 15, somewhere. It's also I'm supposed to bring you beer for my tithe. It's right there. <laughs> beer, wine, and a sheep. I'm doing that now. I've got a goat out back in case you're still hungry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I guess we better get into the book of Judges. Why start now? <laughs> Why start now? <laughs> Sarah was going to say something. I think I interrupted her. Oh, I forgot already. Oh, I'm sorry. Sarah, Sarah keeps... It's funny because Sarah's used... Sarah's not as used to just jumping in, so she's like waving her... raising her hand over here. I'm like, honey, just interrupt. Jump in like the rest of us. She's like, I can't. I'm like, yes, you can. Interrupt. Jump in like the rest of us. I try yeah. not to be a rude New Yorker. <laughs> you gotta be... You gotta know after being married to Rabbi Mike for long enough, you have to interrupt her. You'll never... You'll never be heard. Yeah. Oh man! <laughs> no, holy cow! It's like I was raised by a polite Southern family that it wasn't exactly Southern Baptist, but close enough to it. And therefore, you know, we took turns on all that. And then I meet Sarah's family, and everyone talks at once. And I don't mean like people talk over each other occasionally or interrupt. No, everyone speaks at once all the time. I'm just like, I'm going mad. <laughs> This yeah, is what New York Jews are like, apparently. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> oh, speaking of speaking of Jews, um, w one of my great heroes, King Wells, who I like, he's one of the founders of cr fringe Christian broadcasting. I mean, I've been listening to King Wells since. Oh man, I mean, going back. Oh, like um, we're talking like nine years. I've been listening to King Wells. He was like. Him and Dr. Future were the first shows I listened to back in the day. I mean, if it wasn't for King Wells, there really would be no Iron Show. And so, uh, Teo Tawaki Radio. And anyway, King has just recently embraced the Hebrews are black movement. And he's very clear that he's not a black Israelite. But he holds many of their same beliefs. And so, is there anything... First, I'll ask uh, Rabbi. Ma I'll ask Matthew Miller. Is there anything in the Bible that would convince us that the uh, act the real Jews, the authentic Jews, the authentic Hebrews, were black people? No. Is are, is there anything to convince us they are any color? <sighs> no, not in the Hebrew, not in the Greek. Sorry. Next question. Rabbi Mike. Make the, ne make the next question an intelligent one. 
Okay, <laughs> is there any is there any indication of skin color anywhere besides uh, Esau being red and David being ruddy? Uh, uh, yes. The oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rabbi Mike. No, it's okay. Um, I mean, not really. Uh, like Moses, for example, had an Ethiopian wife for a second wife. So obviously, some of his kids would have been extremely dark. There is some theory that Solomon's mother, her name being Bathsheba, which literally means the daughter of Sheba, Sheba being basically part of um, either down in what's now Yemen, or uh, and it might have been like controlled by Ethiopia at the time, it's possible that Solomon was extremely dark as well. But if you want to know what the ancient Israelites looked like, go look at their brothers in the Middle East today who haven't been scared to the whole world, and you've got a pretty good idea of the hair, eye, and skin tone range that, uh, they, that the ancient Israelites would have had. Now, Jews today, by virtue of having been scattered literally to every nation on the planet, come in all shapes and sizes. My wife has some Chinese in her because oh. some of her Jewish ancestry actually came from China uh, and actually has the uh, surname of Chen. Um, I, th there are more Jewish redheads than there are uh, Irish redheads at this particular point. Um, there, and there are blonde Jews that look very Aryan and were able to escape the Holocaust as a result of it. There Partly are Persian. black Jews, and a lot of them emigrated up from Ethiopia back in the 80s. There are uh, Hindi Jews, like the B'nai Manasseh, B'nai Ephraim. There are, uh, there's some evidence that Jews immigrated as far as Japan and actually influenced Shintoism because a lot of the stories you hear in Shintoism actually read out of, you know, like stories out of Genesis. Really? Father? Yep. Uh, I've got a friend who's been doing some research on that, and it's not conclusive yet. But, for example, the story of a uh, father sacrifice, going to sacrifice his son on a mountain and being stopped by heaven at the last minute, things like that, do appear in Shintoism. Suggesting that you know it wasn't necessarily founded by Jews, but that Jewish immigrants may have added some stories into the mix. Point is that Jews literally were scattered to every nation on the planet, and now, due to intermarrying, are have every possible combination of skin, eye, hair color, facial feature that you can imagine on the planet. The original Jews, however, would have been Middle Eastern. And you look at Middle Easterners, what are they? They're pretty much smack in the middle of the range of, um, you know, human variety being in the center of the world, as it were. That's not a surprise. God's going to pick a people to go out and, you know, through whom the whole world will be influenced that aren't too different from anyone else on the planet. Darker yeah. than some, lighter than others. Um, you know, blue eyes being rare but not unknown. Uh, hair mostly tending towards brown, but going all the way from you know black to uh, light uh, to a dark blonde and so forth, um, and you know that's you know just the way it is for any one race to say we are the real Jews and these other Jews are not because they aren't colored like us is pure and simple racism, even if they've got a Hebrew ancestry and most do not, but even if they do, it doesn't matter. And all that should be is. Wow, we also share in this, and therefore the Jews who have been hated through all these years for being Jews are our brothers and sisters, and we will learn to uh, live with them as such. Another thing that, um, there were some kind of points of contention that I had with him. First of all, I just want to say that neither Matthew Miller or myself or Rabbi Mike care uh, if, you know, like if Jesus was a black man, we really don't care. Nope. I mean, that's not, we don't care. We don't have a dog in this fight. Nope. But, and the Romans, um, didn't, by the way, didn't care. But and, you know, they, they, to say that Empire he... Roman spread over Africa. They had plenty of black people in Rome. It wasn't a big deal to them. They didn't care one bit about it. So, you know, the biblical writers certainly didn't either. Now, my m another major contention I had was that, okay, if you want to try to isolate the Hebrews as a race, which you can't do anyway because they're mixed people. But if you wanted to take it back to the roots, you'd have to go to Abraham. And Abraham was from uh, Chaldea, Chaldean or Samaria, Samarian. Uh, he was a Samarian. And the Samarians weren't black or white. They were 
Sumerians. They were well. They might have what? They were Semites. Sons. They were Semites. Yeah. Yep. And so uh, they're they're clearly depicted as far back as you can go. There's literally thousands of of pieces in the Smithsonian. Uh, They were clearly um, Semites. Sorry about that. Uh, They have found a certain pottery. Uh, depicting uh, people of color uh, in not only Chaldea uh, but uh, there in uh, Babylon. Uh, but guess what? Um, they forensically looked at the paint and everything, and guess what? Those dyes had come from Africa. So uh, those were items that had been purchased via traders and things like that. Um, oh, from yeah. Africa. Purchased from Africa. Right. They been oh, so they're, they're actually Africa. African. Oh. For some I mean, bizarre reason, everyone thinks that all trade happened across the Mediterranean and that nobody else had contact with each other. There was trade all over the Indian Ocean. Right. Um, and, as a matter of fact, there, you can find Hindu influences in some of the pagan uh, pre-Islamic uh, right. uh, uh, sites and so forth. I mean, it, it, everyone was interacting with everyone, same as today, just over slightly smaller scales. And like I said, you can absolutely proof uh, of that is when they just take a look uh, at the pigment used and they can track it right down to, well, usually within 100 square miles of where it was made of any pottery. They just check the dye of the paint that made it. It's pretty easy. So the the Sumerians kind of looked like Middle Eastern. They sort of were dark, but not black, somewhere between black and white looking. Look. Well, the Sumerians themselves were actually, they came from elsewhere. Um, they came from somewhere in the northeast. They may have actually originated in the steppes of what we now consider to be like Russia and Mongolia. Oh, no, Russia. Caucasians. <laughs> well, maybe. It, it, there's a little bit of a, there's a big question mark about that because the Sumerian. when you're talking about the Sumerians, there were a lot of Mesopotamian peoples there, and then the Sumerians came down and basically conquered them and integrated in, and there's and there's a lot of scholarly debate about exactly where they came from. Oh. Uh, it's fairly evident that they came when they crossed over into Mesopotamia. They came from basically what we call Iran today, but they weren't native to Iran. So it's, and there's some uh, debate about where they came from before they went through before they had to pass to Iran and move into uh, the Middle East. So it, it's even back then in the dawn of time. I mean, we're talking about you know, Tower of Babel time, there, you see movements of people across thousands of miles to conquer and or trade with each other. The wasn't Nimrod... You recent is silly. Wasn't Nimrod the king of the Assyrians, basically? There's, again, question mark, and, yeah. and there are different theories on who Nimrod was. Uh, I think Nimrod was the prototype for Marduk, who ironically is the Babylonian name for Baal or Satan, but he... um, But he was a man. I mean, it says that he founded the cities Babel, Aruk, Akkad. Yep. I think Peter Begoodgame's done some good research in this area where he has linked uh, Nimrod to... Uh, in Merkar of uh, the well, that's uh, just because he became and uh, Narmer of Egypt. Right. Well, he became deified, but originally he was a man. Yes, and that's the thing is it, when you're looking at all these pagan deities, most of them their histories and, and that kind of there there's one of two. The mythology comes from one of two directions, or else from both commingled. Either the mythology is referring to some historical event that's grown in the retelling. Or the mythology is speaking of some natural cycle in symbolic terms. Um, so, for example, uh, the in the Baal cycle, in the, the stuff we found in Ugarit, there's this whole thing with death swallowing up Baal. And it specifies that Baal, who is the storm god who brought the rains, in the Ugaritic it's a, meaning Canaanite mindset. Uh, w- so it says he was dead for seven years and there was uh, famine and everything else. Uh, so apparently, and there, and this isn't just me. There are some scholars that take this very seriously. The whole that whole part of the cycle came out of a famine and a drought that lasted for seven years. That's kind of interesting because the Bible speaks about drought in that area that lasted for seven years. Yeah. So it's basically taking that event, uh, remembering it, and putting it, and then giving it spiritual significance. Which, um, honestly, I've got no problem with giving that spiritual significance. 
but you also have instances like uh, Marduk is in Hebrew spelled very similar to uh, Nimrod. They both have the letters Mim, Ru, uh, Resh, uh, Dalit in them. Interesting. And so I think that while Baal is, and Baal is Satan, I've got a whole article on my blog I put up last month uh, detailing that. I think that in the Babylonian mythos, that became conflated with Marduk, who was based on a historical conqueror. Um, and so, you, and it, you know, when you're looking at these things, you can't take any of them as truth as you would the Bible. You sort of recognize that there are certain patterns that pop up a lot. We like that, to paint an image, though, of the past in our head yeah. to gain a to gain a sociological understanding, give us some background. I know uh-huh. that's useful. Yeah. One other well, point. Become my fascination lately. Um, I, I still love uh, biblical prophecy, but I've come to realize you can't look forward without looking back. Yeah, and like Matthew so Miller said, been, he chases after what has been. Mm-hmm. I've, I've been enjoying his work on that, and uh, I, I'm, my conclusions so far are tentative. So that's why I'm sort of careful about sharing. I'm like, okay, here's what here's some scholarly opinions on this because I don't have a firm opinion about. All the details. I believe that what the Bible conveys is true, but the Bible, in terms of what it tells us about prehistory, is very sparse. Yeah. And there's a lot of room for additional detail to be added to that. And the question is, okay, how much do we use these other sources to add the details there? God has given us what we need for salvation, obviously. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, nothing happened in, you know, thousands of years between... Uh, Adam and Noah that, you know, was of interest. Obviously, there were a lot of things that were of interest, and the Bible just sort of mentions them, almost as if they were things we were supposed to know already. So I'm trying to find out more about the, and trying to figure out, okay, how do we figure out the background of what is it mentioning and what's going on? Yeah, when these things were written, a lot of this stuff was known, generally. Yep. At least among the the learned men of the time. So, yeah, that's probably why the Bible just figures you should already know it. Um, and and indeed, I mean, as fur- the further we get into the future, the more we know about the past. So a lot of these things, you could say, well, why didn't God let us know better? Well, you know, we're learning more and more every year, and uh, more and more things. Archaeology, archaeology is unearthing, you know, more and more things. We're learning more about the past the further we go in the future. So you, we will, we will get a pretty good idea. We will almost have the kind of background knowledge that the ancients did at some point. Um, one more other, other point I wanted well, to make before we... By the way, that's biblical prophecy in action right there because Daniel... I'm trying to double-check the uh, reference here. Yeah. Uh, knowledge shall be increased. Here we go. Yes, Daniel 12.4. As for you, Daniel, uh, conceal or uh, seal up these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth, and knowledge will increase. Right. So that, the Bible tells us that in the end times, knowledge that was long lost would be discovered that would help us to unseal the books of the Bible. Right. That, doesn't mean, it, that doesn't mean the Bible's insufficient for its primary purpose, which is to bring people to God. It just means that there are certain passages which are, are obscure and subject to a lot of interpretation we would have additional insight on as we got closer to the end. And what about, the what do you think of the idea that uh, going to and fro is not Learjets and Chevys, but um, going to and fro in the Word with Bible software? <laughs> well... You have to do that because Hebrew goes one way, Greek goes the other. <laughs> oh, exactly. wow! All languages and are written towards Jerusalem. Eyes opened. And, right, yeah. Oh, which is the whole purpose of uh, a meridian, uh, just what mm-hmm. he said. Now, this, this is all part of ehemeristic eschatology, which I am well versed in. So, mm-hmm. uh, even even the heavens are designed this way. Um when you go to any, uh, you know, astro- uh, uh, astronomy uh, programs, you'll take note that they divide the heavens into hours. Well, zero hour is the pivot point where the ecliptic meets the equator. That's why they're all <laughs> That's why each of the uh, signs that God's given us is in a particular hour, and it has its particular season. So, yes, going to and fro, well... Uh, by extrapolation, what is hour 12 in the heavens? It's on the other side of the heavens uh, where the equator meets the ecliptic over there. Because there's two points in the heavens. One is zero, it's meridian. 
one is 12 noon so uh you know this plays a part uh in eschatology in more than one way uh it's just we're supposed to well realize that you can't realize those things unless you have a biblically based uh criteria uh, for what you actually know and that which falls outside the bible that which you think you know uh, yep. once once you come to a reckoning of that in your mind uh then you can see then you can hear uh, by extrapolation as as he himself has taught us so uh going to and fro uh <laughs> ladies and gentlemen that's really got nothing to do with travel i assure you it's got nothing to do with travel uh but that is really interesting. So, really, it's could we could we get that out of the Hebrew? Of course, we can. <laughs> I, I figured mean, we yeah, could. I, I mean, you wouldn't I just say said that, that unless you're not going to hear me say anything uh, that falls outside the parameters of my foundation. Right. Not anything. Well, I and mean, by the way, I mean, it, for for those who are like you know, you're hearing Matthew use these terms, and you're not sure about them, go look them up. And one of the things you can pick up that's kind of nifty to play around with um, that helps you to visualize how the heavens proceed, because let's face it, most of us live in cities or suburbs. We see a handful of the brightest stars, but we don't really see the constellations. We have no idea where the Milky Way is. Uh, go get a little program called Stellarium. Okay, It's, for, it's free download online. It takes into account precession. It takes into account the wobble in the Earth's uh, orbit. You can go all the way from, I think, uh, nine, uh, basically uh, 100,000 BC to 100,000 AD in terms of how far the program will go into the past and the future. And you can sit there and like run it so that you can actually watch the heavens spin in uh, in fast motion to see how they wobble and how they proceed and so forth. It's nifty to play around with. And is it important? Well, quite possibly because the Bible was written by people who spent a lot of time at night staring up the heavens with no other light sources. And the Bible is full of references to the heavens. I'm not talking astrology. I'm just talking about references that mark times and places and so forth. Like Revelation chapter 12 gives us the what the sky looks like at the time of Yeshua's birth or shortly before it. So the um, you know the, these are de these are things you can get into. Um, Matthew Miller has talked a lot about it. He's put out a number of videos and articles and so forth that you can really get into. Spend a little time familiarizing yourself. You don't have to make it yourself an expert in this, but just sort of get your arms around it, and then some of the stuff you read in the Bible will make sense to you. I couldn't have said that any better. Yeah, what's the name of that program? Do you guys know? It's like Solar Surveyor. It's just a basically just the solar system. Mm -hmm. it gives you views of the. It's like Stellarium, only it's just the solar system, and you can. Do you have you heard of that, Matthew? Uh, no, I haven't heard of that one. The, the main <clears throat> main one that I use is Astro Viewer because it will give me a right angle to my exact position on the planet. So, uh, the Lord Himself tells us that. Um, well, the star I came over the Messiah. Well, you give me your grid coordinates and you give me a time of day and I can tell you exactly what star is standing over you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I use Astro Viewer uh, probably more than anything uh, because it can, uh, because with it I can turn the solar system uh, vertically uh, or horizontally uh, to get my perspective from where I'm at. I can change position. I can make myself... Uh, have the vantage point of the moon or any comet that I want uh, to see the course because of course that's what uh, a sign is all about it's it's course uh, so uh, but the one you you said I don't I'm not familiar with that one Stellarium it's one that um, I came across when I was just looking for something it's nifty for the fact that you can you can set it up to show you what the horizon looks like in like several different areas. Um, it's got a night mode where it goes to a dim red so you can like take it on a laptop out with you if you're trying to like uh, set up a telescope and figure out where exactly you point your telescope to find a particular object. Uh, you can set it to any 
place on the planet by latitude and longitude. Um, it goes, you know, it, you can sit there and view the heavens in the past and future. You can watch them uh, go, you know, in fast forward or fast reverse. Uh, so you can you can actually it takes into account even the wobble of the Earth, where you can see the pole star shift from uh, Polaris, which is now if you want to go backwards to um, Terminal with the stars, but it's like in the tail of Draco and, and so forth. You can actually see the wobble there. You can make the Milky Way appear in slightly brighter colors than it normally does, so you can tell exactly where it is. Um, it thing, it, it, you can see all the constellations both by just, you know, the standard lines with, you know, names, or you can have actual pictures appear to, get, to help you understand the way that they were seen. I mean, it's, it's a nifty program, especially if you decide to go out stargazing. Um, and it's very useful for being able to verify when someone says, okay, this is what this guy's going to look at, at, like at this time and place. It's like, oh, well, let's look that up. Let's see, let's see what's looking there. Um, the one Johnny was talking about is very useful for getting sort of an, a view of the solar system, like if you were outside of it or floating through it. Which right, is that's what Stan Dale uses. Up. Stellarium is useful to see how it looks from the planet, from the Earth. You know the one I'm talking about then? I, I know a couple like it, and I think I know the one you're talking about specifically. I used it some years ago when I was trying to uh, lock down um, some ideas about planetary alignment and that. Kind of, I was trying to see, okay, are they really aligned, or is it just sort of a visual effect from the Earth? You know, things like that, and, and those kind of programs were very useful for that. So Yeah, Stan Deo talks about it. That's the one he uses. Yeah, I want to say solar system surveyor or solar surveyor. Anybody, uh, w anybody wants knows that program? I've been, I, w I'm, I want it so. Um, ironshowstudio at gmail dot com. That's ironshowstudio at gmail dot com. Ironshowstudio at gmail dot com. Uh, we should give out our email addresses here. Uh, Matthew Miller. Uh, you can find me at the prophetico.net or biblesourcecode.com. Uh, you can email, uh, prophetico at mail.com and hit me every time, I guess. Rabbi Mike? Uh, you can get me at michael.bug, that's M-I-C-H-A-E-L dot B-U-G-G -G at gmail.com. Uh, you can also catch my blog at returnofbenjamin.com or else returnofbenjamin.wordpress.com, but I have reserved the, do the uh, domain. And it is a, it, it, I mean, it's just my blog. It's been a little bit slow on the updates lately due to the move, but I've got, uh, I've got several years worth of just writing speculations and so forth in there. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, you can catch me by email if, You've got a question. I've got an article on it. My response will probably be to say, "Hi, how are you doing? Here's an article I wrote on that, <laughs> or here's an article somebody else wrote on it." But um, if I'll just warn people, it's like we're we're settling out here. It's not as bad as when we were in mid move. I may still be a little bit slow to respond. I will get back to you. But if it goes a day or two, don't get discouraged. It's just me having to wait a couple days to really get caught up on a question or whatever. Um, and if you're listening to this live, you never heard the Iron Show before, don't know how to find it, the past shows, wow. you can, for all the live shows, it's fringeradionetwork.com slash category slash iron. Fringeradionetwork.com slash category slash iron. For all the Iron Show live archives and ancient Iron Show studio sessions, available at, of course, ironshow.com. And, uh... You know, uh, we should maybe talk a little bit about Judges before we go so I can s call the episode uh, Iron Judges Part 11 or 12, sort of. We got all the way through uh, Chapter 8 last time, right? Yeah, yeah, we did. And did we want to cover any other things there? Um, no, I... I've got something from the beginning of Chapter 9 I'd like to uh, highlight tonight, if nothing else, if only because it helps... It helps uh, illustrate a pattern in the scriptures. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, okay. turn your Bibles or Bible software to Judges chapter 9. Yep. And I'm, one. I happen to be reading from the New American Standard. Uh, I just happen to like the literalness of it, plus it's what I found at the time I went out looking for a wide margin Bible, and I'm sure as heck not trying to transcribe all these notes into another Bible at this particular point. Um, <laughs> so uh, Judges chapter 9, verse 1. 
And Abimelech, the son of Yerubabel, went to Shechem and to his mother's relatives and spoke to them and to the whole clan of the household of his mother's father, saying, Speak now in the hearing of all the sons of Shechem, which is better for you, that seventy men, all the sons of Yerubabel, rule over you, or that one man rule over you? Also remember, I am of your bone and of your flesh. And his mother's relatives spoke all these words on his behalf in the hearing of all the leaders of Shechem. And they were inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our relative. They gave him seventy pieces of silver from the house of Baal Berit, from which Abimelech uh, hired worthless and reckless fellows, and they followed him. Then he went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the sons of Urubel, seventy men on one stone. But Yotham, the youngest son of Urubel, was left, for, for he hid himself. I want you to notice, what's the number that keeps popping up in this particular passage? Number 70. Okay, Why? Well, when God uh, divided the nations. Yes, table of nations, Deuteronomy. The table of nations, there are 70 nations listed in the table of nations. And you're talking about after the Tower of Babel, are you not? Yes, I am. The Tower of Babel is where the nations were divided, according to uh, Deuteronomy 32.8 in both the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls, according to the number of the sons, sons of, of God. God. And these are angelic, or... These are what we might call archangels or archons. They're more than angels, definitely more than demons, less than the true God of the universe. Amen. Uh, the, the fact that there were 70 sons of God... Seventy Sons of the High God was something that was pretty much a common motif in the Middle Eastern religions of the day, particularly the Canaanite one. Yeah, everyone just sort of understood that there were 70 of these guys running around. And so when God told Moses, you know, I, I want you to pick out 70 elders of the children of Israel and bring them up on the mountain to meet me in the book of Exodus. What's he saying? God was establishing Israel as a new divine council to replace the 70 sons of God who fell uh, wanting to take over the nations. And so here, when uh, Yerubel, meaning Gideon, reestablished his rule on Israel, he reestablished what later the rabbis would call the Sanhedrin. You see it referenced in the New Testament in a number of places, where you would have 70 elders plus the high priest. The 70 plus 1. So you had the 70 sons of Gideon plus Gideon. And here you have Abimelech, one of the sons of Gideon, and he, it turns out that he's um, the son of a prostitute, as I recall. He, they give him 70 pieces of silver from the house of Baal Berit, meaning Baal of the Covenant, and he hires people to murder his 70 brothers, the 70 elders that were ruling over Israel. All through the scripture, when we see this number 70 come up, it is either in reference to Israel ruling as God intended them to, these, you know, having a court of 70 that ruled over the nation and thereby represented God staying and putting in Israel all the might, all the spiritual might of all the sons of God, basically saying, I am starting over with these mortals and they will be my new divine counsel and I will dwell in their midst. Or we see it come up in reference to the punishment of Israel. It's basically, God, Israel either has to be a divine council, and I'm using Dr. Michael Heiser's terms on that, and I'm looking forward to his new book coming out. But Israel either has to be a divine council, ruling along with God, or it becomes subject to the fallen divine council, the archons that rule over the nations, and the nations oppress Israel. The same is true of the church, because the church is what? The church is the 70 nations plus Israel. Okay, this is why it's foolish when people talk about replacement theology in the church replacing Israel. No, Israel is the firstborn son. It cannot be replaced. It is being added to because Israel was the 71st. Israel was the special nation that God took for himself so that he would reclaim the 70 nations. God wants people of all nations to follow him. Israel was just the starting point to go and do that. But the fact that God is completing that plan doesn't make Israel obsolete any more than the fact that my parents had two more children after me makes me obsolete. It means that God's plan was bigger than they realized early on. 
And so in the same way, the church, the true body of Messiah, either has to act as a divine council, act as those who indeed will judge angels, or in punishment, the church becomes subject to the fallen powers of this world. And the church becomes deluded and polluted by the fallen powers of this world. For those who overcome, Yeshua says, you will sit with me on my throne as I sit on my father's throne. But for those who don't, okay, what happens in those seven letters? He explains the punishments that would come on them if they didn't live up to what God intended for them. And here we see the prototype of that being set up in the book of Judges. Once again, everything in the book of Judges has come upon the church in a slightly different form. And that's just another example of it. The church became conquered an empire by peace, but then became polluted by the empire just like Abimelech, lost its spiritual authority, and over time lost its temporal authority as a result. Matthew Miller, now we're into numbers now, so I know you've got some stuff to share. Matthew? Yeah, I, I guess I will add to this. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you're supposed to hear what he just said. Because here, uh, your strongs is going to tell you that it's H241 in verses 2 and 3. But it's not, because it has a prefix bet and a, pref and a suffix yod. That's 70. So, <clears throat> let me... Uh, let me read those again. Well, let's try the King James Version. Uh, it says, verse 2, Speak, I pray you, in the ears. In the ears. Okay, so look at your Strong's, and you're going to see some funny-looking letters, but you at least need to, to uh, figure out what four letters those are you're looking at, and I'll say it again. It's uh, 241. It's ears. Okay? In this case, it has a prefix bet and a suffix yod, and it's 70. So he's wanting you to hear it. Now, what he just said about the church and us being added to the one, uh, that phrase uh, that he read there, uh, you know, flesh of, uh, you know, my flesh, bone of my bone, you should remember that type of phraseology, okay? Okay. Uh, because it should stick out to you about, uh, well, what it is that uh, Laban uh, said when he was uh, trying to barter and to get in back good uh, with the Lord's servant. Everybody remember what happened there? Everybody bring that to mind? Okay, because that's Genesis 29. Uh, what did Laban say? He said to Jacob, because you are my relative, you should therefore serve me for nothing. Tell me, what shall your wages be? So, when I read this, uh, well, I'm looking at it in Hebrew, but when you read this, it immediately, bam! I know the circumstances of why Laban said that. I know everything that happened. I've been able to bring that to mind and recall that type of thing being said. You know, remember, uh, I am, uh, you know, of your bone and flesh. Uh, that type of phraseology there, uh, what you see in the Hebrew, well, what you see in English, what you should really try to strive for. I mean, um, if you don't know anything about what I'm talking about, then forget about, uh, you know, the astronomy programs. You need to start really looking into what God really said. Because uh, there, uh, you know, the strong is going to uh, try to tell you that of what God said right there was uzin. No, that's not what he said. He said 70. <laughs> it's not pronounced like that at all. So, you wouldn't be able to see that he was literally, I mean, as God spoke this right here, he's literally looking at you, tapping at his ears. Listen to the 70 part. This is important. Uh, you're supposed to see something here. Uh, so, I guess you should have saw that coming. If if you have any reckoning at all 
of my perspective. You should have saw that coming. Uh, but here, in this chapter, uh, God does that uh, with the strangest of things. Because that's not the only time 70 is here. But the other times Rabbi Mike didn't cover. Uh, so we'll let that uh, hmm, ferment... Uh, until we read those verses. While we do, can I uh, make an observation and ask you a question? Actually, I'm going to ask you a question in the form of my observation so that you might comment because I don't really know what to ask you, but I'll just make my observation and, <laughs> and then you <laughs> shall... I shall make... <laughs> You'll do flex. <laughs> I shall make my observation and ye shall issue commentary thereof. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, you know, so likely all over the place with that question. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people that study um, these areas often say that seventy is also usually associated with seventy-two, and s one of the reasons is that seventy is usually uh, aligns with the Bible and the Table of Nations, but uh, seventy-two. Um, is um, uh, is more associatable with uh, myths of other cultures. So um, a lot of times when you hear 70, you can also figure 72. You can associate that with it. Now, I've just noticed just an observation as I was reading along with you guys that, okay, they killed... This guy is a brother of... And he's... This guy is a brother, and he's got 70 other brothers. Okay, so he kills 70. and But one of them, uh, uh, Jotham, uh, hit himself, so he didn't kill Jotham. So we have himself, right. 70 brothers, and Jotham is 72. Right, two remained. So 72 is there. What is the significance? Is that... Could you comment on that at all? Well, two is by standard definitions when concerning brothers. It doesn't matter where you go. Uh, Jacob and Esau, uh, of course, Ephraim and Manasseh, we could do this all day long. Oh, yeah. Cain and Abel? Uh, yeah, Cain and Abel. Uh, this stretches on out to the, uh, you know, the two witnesses. Uh, we can do this all day long. We can literally do this all day long. Uh, so, uh, yes, you have the aspect of the 70... Uh, and you also have the aspect of the two. Of course, uh, in Rabbi Mike's uh, discourse, all of you know full well uh, what the Lord your God was doing whenever you have um, the ten lost tribes of Israel, right? Well, buy yourself a clue. Uh, There's two more. What God has done uh, has divided Israel into two parts. Um, so he just does this. Well, it's what he does. That is what he does. Uh, so... So we have That's, another 10 plus the 2. Right. So we'll find this a lot. Uh, we'll find a number and then we'll find plus 2. A That's lot. right. You'll, you'll find 2 defined by the 70. You always do. But the actual but, number of the brothers total was 72. Am I missing that? Well, no. The, to the total number... <laughs> Oh my goodness, the 70 brothers, right. one that uh, slaughtered the rest and one that survived. It, it is a riddle, Johnny. It's a riddle. Now, I will say this. Um, when you get into the aspect of 72, there's another reason why uh, the scripture does that. It being a degree of the circle of the earth, it being a... Uh, well, you can uh, more people will be able to associate it quicker uh, with the 144,000. That is the division of it. Yes. Uh, you see, you, you cannot get degrees. Uh, the circle of the earth cannot be defined by 70. It must be 72. Right. And astrology, I know. I mean, I'm not promoting astrology, but I know that a lot of the Bible lines up with astrology as, as far as like an astronomy type astrology. If right, astronomy. Now wait a minute. Let's not confuse everybody. Yeah, astronomy's the mechanics. Okay, astrology is the hoodoo. Right. There That's is a correct. certain type of biblical astrology, though, as far as signs and seasons, that is nothing like pagan astrology. 
Well, yeah. well I guess you'd have to call that, would you have to just call that astronomy, or is there a word I, for that? No, I call it by its proper term, as defined uh, by the Greeks, it's celestial somology. Cool. That's what God says, okay? God says, I have defined these in the parameters for signs, for you to be able to tell, uh, you know, this, that, and the other in its season. So... The proper definition for it is celestial somology. So if like a new ager comes up and says, dude, man, are you into astrology? You say, no, but I'm into celestial som- somology. Somology, yes. <laughs> yes, and I can explain to them what God was doing. Husing, actually, what they have reference to, I mentioned it earlier, uh, he- ehemeristic eschatology. These things they understand. That's why I am... Um, well, that's why I have to talk with them so much because they uh, they will come to me and 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 ask me um, because they hear from around the ride that I know I don't think I know and I can I can tell you I can answer your question for you and um, you know it's just something that I can do um, you know the Lord has set me aside to be able to speak to those people because I can take them outside and all right let's wait to you know it gets dark and I can show you his wonders. I can tell you why they mean that thing, what he said when he said, uh, why the, uh, you know, the 153 uh, fishes, uh, that sign is in the pivot point in the heaven. Uh, and the other one, of course, is his bride. That's the other pivot point in the heaven. I can explain all these things to them. I can explain them as to why the fish gate is referenced in Ezekiel's temple. Of course, that lies at the end of the bow, the Milky Way that he set in the heavens. And he said he would never alter it. The reason why he said that is because, well, the equator and the ecliptic and, uh, and our position in the heavens, uh, he has made a promise with that. So that's why the fish gate is, of course, at the uh, south celestial pole. That's why we had a, uh, a, uh, a supernova there. Uh, that's why it's named, of course, Dredo, uh, there from the Greek. Uh, that's that fish that uh, people paid great big bucks uh, to go on... Uh, a fishing tours to hunt because um, it has this lines on it, but when it swims, it swims so fast. It of course looks like it's vibrating. It, it looks like it's it's um, uh, the the lines are moving. Uh, it becomes alive, and when you take it out of the water, when it dies, it of course turns golden. Uh, so that's why, and everybody knows that. Uh, that's read their history books. They know all about uh, the Dorito fish and, and why uh, that gate is mentioned, uh, but. There's a rhyme and a reason behind everything that God says. Are you talking about like the fish gate at En Gedi? Yes, the fish gate at En Gedi. Yes, correct. Uh, cool. That lies at the South Celestial Pole. That's where it is. The South Celestial Pole, well, <laughs> is in the constellation of the fish, Dorito. Wow. And, when, and when you take it out of the water and it dies, it's just like Christianity in motion. It turns golden once it dies outside of the water. It turns gold. And everybody knows this. I mean, this is like a historical fact from thousands of years ago. Everybody knows it. Well, except Christians, I guess. But Yeah, except um, for me. Now I know. So, uh, uh, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, there's a whole lot more there than meets the eye because you can't, you're not looking at it in the way he wrote it. Um, and and I'm, I'm not... I'm not bashing anybody, okay? I'm just, uh, if all you can do is uh, is the English, then do what you can do. I mean, you've got marvelous resources at your hands. Uh, you know, you got the, the Strongs, you got theirs and all that good stuff, and that's what you should spend your time doing, not being a pothead or, you know, not being, um, uh, you know, a drunk. Uh, you should retrain your... Uh, too much television... Exactly. Yes. Turn the television off. Um, you know, I, I, heard our... this, I heard this one preacher on the radio the other day saying, um, you know, if uh, you know, he goes, uh, he goes, I don't understand why these people are studying the Hebrew and the Greek and all this stuff and breaking down verses. Because if your friend sent you a letter, would you try to translate it into Hebrew and Greek and figure out what he meant? No, you would just read the letter. And I was thinking. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, that doesn't even make sense because, number one, your friend didn't write the letter in Hebrew or Greek. 
Right. I mean, so it didn't need to be translated in the first place. Right. And had he had written it in Hebrew and Greek, you would have to try to actually translate it properly and do a lot of studying before you could really figure out what he really meant. <laughs> right. Well, uh, l- l- let me say this, that... Um, the scripture speaks loudly of the simple-minded, but uh, there's something uh, that he needs to realize is that uh, the two organs most associated uh, with what he's concerned with, uh, your inner self, that's two organs actually in the Hebrew, and he probably, well, like I said. Is that heart and brain? Uh, no, not even remotely close. Uh, but Really? Anyway. What are uh, they? The Lord does mention the simple-minded, and I'll just leave it at that. You know, and the simple-minded, you know, I mean, if you're not smart enough to grasp all this stuff, you know what, that's okay, because, you know, basic, um, basic salvation is, is so simple, I mean, God designed it for retarded citizens to be able to grasp, I mean, believe in Jesus. Well, and and we all need to realize uh, the part that psychology plays in this, Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is common knowledge and has been common knowledge for many, many, many decades upon decades that you are easily programmable. You are habitual is what you are. And what you need to do is if if you're addicted to um, a baseball, uh, you need to realize that it's a psychological fact that you can reprogram your mind to do something else habitually in its place. Uh, it's common knowledge. Uh, so you could immediately... Uh, within 120 days, uh, turn around your habit of watching baseball into studying God's Word. And all psychologists can tell you this. God, you so, could do that with bad habits, too. Yes, yes, you can. You're, you're, easily, uh, you're easily programmable. Easy. Well, I mean, here's, a, here's an interesting thing I came across. Um, when you have a significant experience or something that your brain wants to put into memory, within 10-15 minutes, your brain is growing new connections between the neurons contained in the memory. That means that your experiences, your thoughts, your emotions, your feelings, everything else, are hard-coded into the hardware of your brain, not just the software. And this is one reason why salvation has to be such a radical experience. Okay? Because it's not just your... Uh, you know, thoughts in the sense of software that be changed. Your very biology works against you, unless the spirit of God is with you. So, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Be very careful what you put into your brain. Just like you know, you should be careful what you put in your body. Too much alcohol isn't good for the body. Not good for the brain either, but it's really not good for the body. Too much food of you know, too much. Salt. Salt, too much fat. Salt and fat are both things our bodies need. That's why we crave it. Too much of it is bad for us. And in the same way, too much sports, entertainment, um, you know, what have you, that can be bad for us. You know, like right now, I've been enjoying reading a novel on my way to and from work. I'm looking forward, you know, it's a novel I'm enjoying. But I'll tell you what, I read about three nonfiction books going to and from work uh, since I'm writing Marta every day. Uh, before I, you know, said, you know, I'm going to take a little break and read a novel. There's nothing wrong with reading the novel. But if I dedicate myself completely into just reading idle fantasy and that kind of thing, it's like, okay, am I really dedicating myself? It's all things in moderation, all things in control. And just understand that, you know, you're, if you're coming from a position of having been trapped in sin, let's take one of the most obvious ones we've been sort of dodging, pornography. Okay, you put that into your brain, your brain has now hardwired itself, altered the hardware to contain all that pornography. That's brutal. And, fur- and furthermore, your brain is now programmed to, when you think about it or look at it, it releases endorphins that make you feel good and take the stress of the right. day away. Right. Uh, and you know, now you're really, you're fighting an addiction that's worse than alcohol because you don't have to go to the liquor store to get it. And- First right. off, it's there on the internet. Even if it weren't, it's in your brain. It's in your memories. And these endorphins have changed you. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's talk about the physiological side of this. Uh, you just become a pervert. You're no longer a Christian. Ooh. Ooh. Did I sting you? Brutal. That was brutal, wasn't it? Tag, you're it. Tag, you're it, baby. 
Okay? That's brutal. You, are, you have been formed from your salvation to be a new creature. You voluntarily polluted what it was that he wanted. And you have created a pervert. Congratulations, you're not a Christian. Yet, it's still reversible. That's right. I didn't say it was permanent. Yeah, I, I just, just wanted, I didn't want to I was scare, just letting them know. I didn't want to scare everybody too bad. <laughs> well, somebody had to say it. Because, I don't mind I mean, scaring people. I just don't want them to feel hopeless. Oh, no. It's, I didn't ever say it was hopeless. I was just letting them know that they did that thing themselves. It's really scary. They walked out and they strung themselves up, uh, you know, just like Judas did, by their own volition. Nobody forced them to click on that link, did they, Rabbi Mike? No. Nope. Did somebody else pay for the Playboy? Huh? Uh. They that did. came out of their wallet. Brutal. So, I mean, just like Judas, they walked down, got themselves a string, strung it up in a tree, and fell. Okay. Congratulations, you did it. You took what God had designed to be good. And you polluted it into a dead thing. It's tough to own it. Holding the pink slip on that is brutal. <laughs> it is, ain't it? But, <laughs> Matthew, Miller <laughs> just, Matthew, Matthew Miller just made you own it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, that's, that's important to know, though, that you did it. A lot of these yeah. things, uh, when bad things happen, we go, oh, why we ask God, why did you do this? You're like, excuse me, why did I do that? I, <laughs> you got the pink slip on that one, buddy. You own that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's just like um, once you get, you know, several years into psychology, uh, you even come across what happens to, like, thieves. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're changing yourself because that little adrenaline rush that you get from stealing something out of the store – uh, that's what you're feeding. Okay, so congratulations. You've killed the Christian, and uh, you've created a kleptomaniac. You're not a Christian anymore. You're a thief. Congratulations, you did it. I know a lot of kleptomaniacs end up, they don't even want what they're taking. They just want that no. rush. Yeah, yeah, they they need uh, that endorphinizal surge. Yeah, I know, I know. I know all about it. Um, and, you know, hey, uh, if you're just finding out about it from me and Rabbi Mike, you know, I'm sorry about that. I'm glad you know it now. Yeah. Because once you get up in God's face, and you are going to get up in his face, make no mistakes about it. I know you all are trying to wish in, uh, to uh, wish this away, but you will stand before his great white throne, and you will give a reckoning. Make no mistakes about it. And if you want to take your happy self up there as a klepto, knock yourself out. That's your choice. Well, let's back this hey. up with some scripture here. Okay. Uh, lest anyone think that we're, you know, just being too harsh or legalism, legalistic or anything like that. Let's back this up here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of heaven, uh, kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Guess what? That means the guy who sent you, you know, the little piece of paper that looked kind of like a handkerchief and said, send me a donation, I will bless you through this handkerchief. He's not inheriting the kingdom of God because he's swindling you. Okay? But guess what? It gets worse because if you start looking at who is in the lake of fire in Revelation. Let me pull that up real quick. Let's see here. And, uh, where is it? Uh, talks about the New Jerusalem and nothing unclean, nor one who practices abomination lying shall come into the New Jerusalem. Now notice it says one who practices. It doesn't mean if you've ever said a lie, you're going to hell. What it says is, are you a liar? Is that what is part of your, uh, is that part of your nature? Is that how you get through your day? Okay. There's also another one. I'm trying to find it real quick. 
Let's see here. Revelation 21.8 But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers, the word sorcerers there, by the way, comes from the Greek word for pharmacy, and it was drug users, and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Really, you notice that cowards are the first ones on there. Why? Let's talk about those who are willing to say, Oh, no, 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 I'm not a Christian. I'm not a messianic. I, I, you know, Jesus, he's a good guy, but he's not my Lord for this because they're afraid. Whether they're afraid of the sword or they're afraid of being rejected. I know so many Messianics have gone down that path of, you know, they start denying, not, they don't just wake up one morning and, and deny Yeshua, they deny a little piece of who he is at a time to, you know, make some anti-missionary happy. That's cowardly. Not doing what God calls us to do, that can be cowardly. I understand. I'm not saying that, you know, if you've ever balked at God telling you to do something big, that you're going to hell. No. God understands that occasionally, like Jonah, you may need to get swallowed up and sped out by life. But, again, Revelation 28. Cowards are the first on the list of people who will not be in the kingdom of heaven, who will inherit the lake of fire, that will inherit Gehenna. Can I give a few? Please. All right. Uh, let's see. Huh. Let's see what old Matthew can pull out of, his, out, out of his pocket, shall we? How about Galatians chapter 5? Let's start. Oh, I don't know. How about verse 19? Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, the things of the likes of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let's just go to the next book of the Bible. Ephesians chapter 5. Let's just start in uh, verse 3 with this one. But immorality or any impurity, or greed, must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. And filthiness, silly talk, coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Uh, for this you know with certainty, that no immoral... Uh, okay, no, really, this is in English. No immoral, that means none in the Greek, n none or impure person, or covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So, I, 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 I don't know how to say it to you differently than that. I mean, yeah, I could have said it in, in Greek. Um, I could have said it in Hebrew. But, look, do you not understand what immoral is? Do you, do, uh, I mean, Rabbi Mike, what, the terms that he gave, okay, make no sense about it. I just gave you two witnesses, ladies and gentlemen. Let me ask Rabbi Mike. Was there any phrases in there you didn't understand? When are you going to get to the bad stuff? What's up? What's up? Oh, good grief. <laughs> Hey, guys, say something encouraging. I'm feeling condemned right now. All right. Uh, let's see. What do I want to say that is encouraging? Uh, well, hold on. Let me, let me jump in here real quick while you think of something encouraging. Because a lot of Christians like to jump in on uh, homosexuals as, like, you know, <laughs> ultimate sin. Okay. Now... Let's say homosexuals as an actively, you know, pursuing homosexual sex will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Yes. Does it say that people who struggle with same-sex attraction won't inherit the kingdom of heaven? No. 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 There's a difference no. between struggling with the sin and giving into it. All right. There's a difference between recognizing I have a weakness that I need to keep far from me and... Uh, you know, just throwing yourself full bore into it. 
But for some reason, Christians want to jump in on, oh yeah, well, I'm not guilty of that sin, therefore that sin's the worst. <laughs> oh, good grief. I'm looking at this. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's how people really you know, think, though. Filthiness and silly talk. Okay, yeah. silly talk, that's an interesting one. That Let's sounds see. like me. Yeah. <laughs> no. You know what talking about? What's talking about up? Gossip. What's up? What's up? Let's talk about gossip. Yep. You know, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's bad. Murder kills him once. Murder yeah. kills him once. Gossip can kill him dozens of times over. Yeah. And yep. all, too awesome, uh, all too often we have allowed gossip to bloom. While condemning the sins that we think we're not guilty of. Oh, yeah, we didn't think about that. Hang out in 1 Corinthians. I've been doing that the last week or two. and Man, squabbling and arguing. Boy, that's, that's not even allowed. It's not to say that lively debate, you know, as we kick around and try to understand the Scripture better, isn't allowed. But there's a difference between debate and arguing. Yeah. Debate is well, it's like uh, fighting, more like fight. I'm talking. Saint Paul was talking about like fighting amongst each yeah. other. Actually, he's talking arguing, about, yeah, exactly. Fighting, he's talking about strife. Strifes. He's talking about um, people who want to tear people down, not want to challenge an idea. Right. Yeah. He's not talking about uh, like but a debate want to or tear discussion. Tear down people. Yeah. That's the difference. Yeah. Yeah, it's the difference between having a debate and then and then somebody in the debate just resorting to ad hominem remarks, which usually is a sign that they've lost. Right. <laughs> That's been my experience, yes. If you're debating <laughs> someone and they just start insulting you, they've lost. Pretty it's much. over. They're done. <laughs> um, you know, you know, a lot of all the things that you guys have listed, I mean, that's... I mean, you know, I'm a... I've dealt with all those things at one time or another, if not every other day, except for homosexuality. I'm totally not attracted to any men, but aside from that, I've all, I've dealt with all those issues, probably. Um, well, I guess you can't I mean, identify... I think that, didn't we interview a guy back when we find out there was a difference between being a homosexual, in other words, identifying with it, and just saying, oh, I'm going to be this way no matter what, so there, and struggling with same-sex attraction. Yeah. There is a difference between someone who struggles with a particular temptation and someone who happily gives in to it. And I'll tell you what, I mean, when I, uh, my brother, one of my uh, brothers is gay, okay, I've met a lot of his friends and stuff, I've never met a truly gay homosexual. Every single one of them is struggling with some kind of pain. And I think that, you know, it's, it, I think the church in search of a sin that it hasn't committed so that it can say, well, because I haven't committed this sin, we're better than them, has taken people that are hurting and kicked them instead of recognizing, you know what, they're not in the body. We're not to judge them. We're to love them and bring them into that body so they can meet the Lord so that he can yeah. transform them. Yeah, because we all got a choice, Rabbi Mike. Uh, yeah. You know, Cain wasn't a murderer to he threw the stone. Right. I mean, that's that's common knowledge, man. You think the think so? I, I I think the biggest sin of all, and the one the adversary traps us in, is that sin of try of look trying to find somebody to look down on so we can feel better about ourselves. Oh yeah. Right. Right. Yep. Yeah, we so, all do it. I like to say I don't, but I've, I'm sure I've done it. Yep. And, and that's why Yeshua hung out with the tax collectors and the and, and the prostitutes, because it's like, look, these are the lowest of society. These are the ones everyone else looks down on saying, I'm better than them. These are the ones that nobody wants to touch. These are the ones no one wants to minister to, and they're the ones that need it the most. Go and do Maybe. likewise. God does not have any patience at all for religious pride. And unfortunately, I think the church has gotten a lot of religious pride, and I'll be blunt, the Messianics are worse. You got a lot of Facebook Pharisees, too. These, yeah. Those seem... 
<laughs> Facebook first. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys seem to be worse than any church I've ever been to. The, the, the ones that are going to send us hate mail over the discussion uh, over the proper use of wine earlier tonight. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, well, you know what's really funny is the ones that's really women. And they have mm-hmm. these uh, mm-hmm. Facebook accounts that's men. <laughs> you know, so they... Man, they're really laughable. Or, or you run into the other ones too. You you run into some guys that's masquerading as a woman, and 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 he's on one of the girl pages. It's just, come on, man, you're pathetic. <laughs> that's pretty bad. <laughs> I mean, you're 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 pathetic. You you really are. <laughs> yeah, and you never really know. You know, I mean, Johnny could be a ninety year old man in in a gorilla suit. <laughs> <laughs> And it wouldn't surprise us. What's, What's up? up? <laughs> you know, Johnny, it, it's like, it, you know, as I've prayed about, you know, I, I've, God's given me this secular job, and I, I feel in some ways my ministry is on hold. I don't think it's on hold. I think God's just taking me through some additional training. But one of the things that, about my job is that like, as I um, grow in it, I'm going to have lots of opportunities to travel, to meet clients and stuff. And I'm going to be using those travels to go in all, you know, it's like, okay, well, let's see here. I'm traveling and it's the weekend. I'm finding, you know, a local Messianic synagogue and find out who the rabbi is and go meet him. I'm finding a local home fellowship that, you know, I can just sort of drop in and join the meeting. I'm going to be, you know, making those connections. I'm really praying that God's going to open up a, uh, you know, um, client somewhere out in, oh, I don't know, uh, was it Beavertown, uh, Oregon? <laughs> That I can drop in on at least once a year and swing by uh, Johnny. I mean, you know, God, I think God's got to open up those opportunities. Even in a secular environment, there are opportunities to minister. It's not in the big, you know, grand ministry with 10,000 people falling over when you wave your arm that the Spirit works. It's in those little connections. It's in those little things where you recognize, you know what? God has me where he wants me to be now. And I just need to be faithful and look for those opportunities to share where he's offered for me to share. And look for those opportunities to minister where he's offered for me to minister. Uh, and in order to do that, in order to have those opportunities, in order to have that ministry that I think a lot of people out there want, you have to keep yourself clean. Because if you have the burden of sin, you can't fill the spirit. You flee from God like Cain and Adam and Eve. You're trying to find some fig leaf to slap on to you know, hide your sin and hide your shame. God ultimately wants us to be clean, not just for him, although he wants us to love him enough that we'll do it for him. He wants us to be clean because he wants us to be everything we can be. He wants us to be his sons. He wants us to be his replacement divine counsel. He wants us to be in that place where we can judge angels and do it rightly. And he can't work through vessels that insist on making themselves unclean. If you will repent to him, he will make you a clean vessel. But there was a reason why the Spirit didn't dwell with men. The Spirit would come upon men, would allow men to prophesy and so forth, but the Spirit did not dwell in men until the sacrifice of the Messiah. It took that sacrifice to open up the door to make people into roving temples. Yep. That the spirit would dwell in. And when you sin, you bring idols into the temple. Right. And you drive the spirit out. You desecrate it. You have become an abomination. Yep. Oh, did that one sting? Ow, hurt me. so. <laughs> <laughs> if it did Judges sting, chapter it 9. <laughs> I resemble that <laughs> remark. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's getting late, guys. I All gotta, right, guys. <laughs> I got to work tomorrow, man. <laughs> oh, yeah, me too. Yeah, you and me both. Oh, all of us do. Okay, I guess I'm going to issue us out here with a... Blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah! I want to thank Bruce Collins. The Iron Show is on the Fringe Radio Network at the behest of Bruce Collins. I want to thank Rabbi Mike and Matthew Miller for being here with us, hanging out like real men and uh, taking us through life and uh, doctrine and Christianity and a little bit of the Book of Judges. So it's been a heavy duty session. As always, my eyes have been opened a couple times. So I am more than I was when I came into this session, which is what 
we all hope for. And uh, so I want to thank uh, Dr. Future and Peter Goodgame for early inspiration. And I wanted to announce that I'm going to be on a new show, and it's not very often, but uh, it's going to be on the Intrepid Paradigm Broadcasting Network called The Revolving Door, in which each month a different fringe Christian host will come on with a hour show. So I'll be on there once every few months, so look for that. And I'm going to drag Matthew Miller and Rabbi Mike definitely in for a few of those sessions. So, anyway, till next time, remember, Johnny loves you. Good night, everybody.